good. Now that you're mobile, you think you can pull off a raid? Your mother, though. My god, you are sick. Malaria. Welcome back to Frank's Penance, where Frank is just waking up on his next day of being an employee of a militia in South Mali. His original mission was to come here to kill the jackal, however that went very badly wrong. He's come down with malaria and now is just an ordinary militiaman in one of the uh, many vast armies stalking over South Mali. His current objective is to head to a nearby bar in an attempt to find more foreign expats who can help him out during his stay in this harsh land. Covered in mud and splinters, I was walking through the sprawling woods east of Garrison, having just finished constructing a substantial survival shelter. I actually thought being able to do that was an essential IRA skill. As I walked, I began to hear voices and decided to try and approach them while remaining hidden. There was a handful of guys setting up a little campsite in a clearing. From a distance, I could see weapons being passed around. It was like winning the lottery. The IRA were here, in my woods. But the excitement got mutilated pretty fast, and one of their guys came right up behind me and jammed an assault rifle in my face. He shouted a lot and pushed me over to their camp, where the rest of them went hostile and started demanding an explanation from me, stopping short of punching my lights out, probably just because I looked like a homeless vagabond. I was probably scared shitless at the time, but that's not what I remember. All I remember is the disappointment. It was the first betrayal. The family I imagined waited for me in the IRA was an itchy finger away from blowing my brains out. So I've reached the area where the bar is located. It also has two interesting buildings, one of which is a weapon store. At this point in the game, I am forced to attempt to buy something from the weapon store as part of a tutorial, so I'm going to go ahead. The weapon store works in an interesting way. You order the weapons and equipment that you want from this computer, and from then on, the uh, manufacturers will supply you with an infinite supply of that object in uh, special armories located all over South Mali. So all I'm really doing is buying a subscription to this equipment, and then I can use it whenever I want. So there's various things available. I can unlock more weapons by doing missions for the weapons dealers to make me uh, more highly rated in their eyes, uh, in which case they will allow me to buy superior weapons. But for the moment, I'm forced to buy the common rubbish. So I'm going to spend the small supply of diamonds that I got from my last mission yesterday to buy this assault rifle. I can now go into the armory and find that assault rifle and it's going to be in perfect condition which is the most important thing. These newly bought weapons are far superior in terms of their reliability than weapons that have been uh, in use for a while already which are the sorts of things you typically find the militiamen carrying. So really you do want to use weapons that you've bought new rather than ones you've just found. We can see the armory also has supplies of ammunition, petrol for Molotov cocktails and loads of different kinds of explosives which you can use to refill your supplies of grenades, of RPG rounds and I believe of uh, improvised explosive devices a little bit later on. So with that out of the way I'm going to go into this Mike's bar where supposedly I'm going to find some expats who are going to help me out. The main thing I need is to get my hands on some anti-malarial medicine. How are you? You made it out. I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Flora Guillen. You still have that malaria though, don't you? You see that man over there? He has medicine. You go ask him, he might give some to you. You ever get in a bad spot while you're here, you find me, okay? This place is rough. Everybody needs a friend. You'll soon see how bad it is. The war here is out of control. It's not even a real war anymore. Just a, uh, how you say, a free for all. If the two factions disappeared, the people here might have a chance. But they're not going anywhere until somebody makes them. I'd do it myself if I could. No medicine from that. her, but at least she is a friend to me. Let's see what this guy has. You people never stop. Here's the bloody tape, all right? That's it. That's all I've got. Well, aren't you going to destroy it? That's what your friends usually do. Wait, you're not here for the tapes, are you? I see the problem now. You can get the pills you need from the church in Pala. The priest there will help you, assuming you make it in time. Just passes along for me. You can't break a man the way you break a dog or a horse. The harder you beat a man, the tall. So you're not one of them. I'm Ruben Oluagembi, what you call a stringer. 
and you are new, I can tell by the state of your clothes. They are much too clean. You are taking a chance talking to me. I'm persona non grata around here. The warlords want me out of the country. They don't like the story I'm writing. It's about the war, and about them, of course. But mostly it's about the famous arms dealer, the Jaka. That was him on the tape. Do you know I have covered 16 wars across Africa? 16. And every time he has been there, selling his weapons and making a fortune while millions of people suffer and die. He thinks he can continue to do his work in secret, but not this time. These stories, they are going to come out. The jackers, the warlords, the soldiers, the boy soldiers, even the NGOs. I intend to expose the whole sordid mess. I make it sound very dramatic. We'll see if anybody back home even notices. I've been interviewing people for months now. Diplomats, warlords, civilians, whoever I could trick into talking to me. I had some fantastic material. Then the soldiers confiscated my tapes. They said they destroyed them. But maybe not. I don't know. I can't very well go looking for them. I'm no good with a gun, you see. And you need one these days just across the street. You've seen the fighting. The war is getting worse by the minute. It's absurd. Because why are they fighting? For what? You can see the country is destroyed. The people, the diamonds, the cities. But about the rages on with the jackass weapons, no less. It is going to end badly. And I'm afraid I'll be here to see it. I'm a bit of a robber neck, I suppose. Listen, if you find any more of my tapes, please bring them back to me here at the bar. I need them for my story. I'll tell you right now, I can't pay you. I can only offer you my worthless friendship in return. So this journalist has offered me a way to get some medicine from a local priest. Now let's just see what this last guy standing around has to Let's offer. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. You're the new guy. Badass. Name's Warren. Hey, you ever need any help out there, give me a call. I'm serious. I'm the guy you want when the ship goes down. Well, he seems like a pretty freakish character, but he is now my second buddy. He is a guy who will attempt to save my life if I get into a dire situation out in the field. So he is good to have. Flora, the woman there, is my first best buddy. And what she'll do is attempt to offer me superior ways to complete certain missions. And if I accept her advice, she will reward me by upgrading my safe houses. So now I need to head to that church that was mentioned by the reporter in order to acquire some of this medicine that I need to stay alive. Perhaps it was those empty feelings that turned me into a sucker for the guy who emerged from the woods with a bloody deer across his shoulders. It was my first look at the man I would pledge to die for and the man who would make sure that pledge was put to the test. First he asked me a bunch of questions and I blabbed out the answers between the tears. The rest of the guys laid off me and went about their business. I told this bearded hunter all about my trivial strife and he listened like I was delivering the Sermon on the Mount. Finally, when I ran out of stupid things to bitch about, he came closer to me and said, I know how you feel. Call me Fergal. If you asked me what I was doing right then, I would have said I was talking to God. The roller coaster of those few minutes crashed me right into Fergal's muddy hands. He told me that he was the leader of the active service unit I had stumbled across. I decided at that moment to start a tirade about how much I believed in the Republican cause and the IRA struggle. I was saying it so that they would let me leave. But looking back, you could say it had quite the opposite effect. So now I'm back in the town of Parla, a place that was erupting in civil war just a couple of days ago, but now seems to have mellowed out. There are still tons of militiamen hanging around, observing some kind of fragile ceasefire. Now moving through the town, I was able quickly to find the church. It's right next to the hotel I was staying in when all of the shit went down, and the jackal found me initially ruining my plan to kill him. The inside is packed out with supplies and one solitary minister. I'm sorry, there aren't regular services at the moment. Oh, you're not well. You should see a doctor before you really need a priest. Did Ruben send you? He had something for me. I would be very happy to give you what little medicine I had in exchange. I think you should take one of those right away. Those will only last a short while, but I may know where to get more. Not all of my people have left. Many are trapped, scared of what will happen if they are caught trying to leave. And there are others who have chosen to stay. We try to help where we can, and we could use someone like you. You should come back when you require more medicine. 
So I'm safe for now. I've got some medicine and this minister appears to have a way for me to get more. He's willing to smuggle me some more medicine if I help people, refugees, escape the war-torn nation. So when it comes to that, I guess I'll have no choice. So now we're jumping forward to the evening of that day. Frank is hanging out in the area outside Mike's bar, having spent the day looking around the area to acquire supplies. And now he's going to go inside, see if he can find any more expats to speak with in an attempt to solicit more support so he can have a little bit more of a stable life here in South Mali. I enter and there is a new face. Hey, girl, I have a little problem. There's this guy, Commander Davenport. Dude's been running the supply chain I've been helping out. Problem is, the guy's trying to run his crew out of the old fort they got near, of course. Point is, his documents are still at the fort, main building. If you can get him and bring him back, I can finish what the dumbass started. Thanks, man. So I've just accepted my first buddy mission. Missions that exclusively increase the support of your buddies for you. Special missions that don't actually affect the progress of the story in any particular way. So it seems that this guy, Paul Ferenc, wants me to go and acquire some documents that have been left behind in some sort of fort right on the edge of South Mali. So I need to prepare for my journey and get going and hope that my first expedition into the depths of South Mali goes well. Fergal asked me if I hated the British. Only one correct answer there. He asked me if I knew the name of his weapon, which currently was laying across his bent legs as he crouched to get closer to my groveling self. I told him it was an AR-18 and started to describe its attributes in detail that would have made my mother proud just for confirming I wasn't immune to education. Fergal looked to the other men and was about to say something, but stopped short. They wouldn't have liked what he was going to say. Instead, he said it just to me. He offered to let me help them out on their mission and asked when I could be ready. I didn't say anything, but I showed them the crappy pack of survival gear I had strapped to my back. Nothing they could use at all. Fergal started laughing. I thought that was good at the time, but now I know why he was laughing back then. The memory makes me want to rip his throat out. So the deal was this. These guys, this cell, were heading north on foot to perform some mission. It only took them a few minutes to let slip that they planned to kill someone. I was too young to be shocked by that idea, if that's what you were thinking. My part of the mission was to carry their shit and carry it a damn long way. Maybe Fergal just made me do that so the other guys would actually get some use out of me and not think I'm just some crazy tag-along kid. As for first things to do when you've basically joined a terrorist group for no reason, walking a long way with a lot of silence around you is about the worst choice. All I was thinking was that I was doing something stupid. My mother's voice in my head was letting me know this every two seconds. But I was excited too. A weird, freakish excitement that I was doing something people didn't want me to do, but that they would thank me for later. Still waiting on that thank you. I didn't want to die. I didn't want to end up in prison. But I didn't want to go home either. So I kept walking, staring at the bags carried by the guy in front of me, which pretty obviously were hiding a sniper rifle the size of a goddamn bicycle. Fergal got bored of leading the way and eventually came to walk alongside me. He didn't talk for a while. We just marched over the hills and through the motionless fields, seeing no one, not even animals, and slowly being cooked in our jackets by the afternoon sun. Eventually, he started asking me about my past. Too dumb and nervous to actually use my memory, I started making stuff up. But the stuff I made up was way less interesting than the real story. I pretty much described the life of a normal kid, proving that despite what everyone was probably thinking, I do know how to be normal. Virgil started telling me about sniping instead. Pretty much came out with the fact that the mission was to blow some British cop's head off to make a point. Didn't tell me what the point was though. Wouldn't tell me how far away this was either. He told me I had to earn access to that information. At the time I was like, sure, sounds honourable and all that shit. But it's pretty damn obvious he didn't have any answers and was just bullshitting me like a five year old. So now, still under the cover of night, I've reached the area where this fort is located. 
Already, using my monocular, I can see that there's a sniper on top of one of the tall towers who can see uh, the area from which I am approaching. So if he actually looks in this direction, I could be in trouble. I'm trying to keep low and relying on the fact that it's dark uh, for him not to actually see me. I'm going to be making my approach to the fort using a small path I can see on the map going up towards the east side of the fort. The main road is on the west side and I'm assuming that's the side that they've most heavily defended. So hopefully this will make things a little bit easier for me. Now that I'm among these rocks there is some potential cover from the sniper. At the moment I can't see where he is. I think he is probably covering the valley to the north so I felt okay coming up this path. However you can see just then I spotted a guard coming down the path in the opposite direction. So I've dived into cover behind this rock and now I'm going to wait to see if he passes by. Now I can go on without firing a shot and hence not alerting anyone in the fort that anything bad is going on. The guard's getting closer. I'm taking aim in case he sees me. It would be pretty easy for him to notice me here if he just looks over. Still relying on the fact that I'm in some long grass and the darkness to hide my presence. He seems to actually be quite intent on staring at something on the floor. Perhaps this is a very distracted guard. So he simply stands where I need to walk and eventually turns around and starts heading back up the hill. An unfortunate decision because I still need to get up there. I need to get past him. I decide that I might be able to take him out silently using my machete if I come up behind him and take him out, take him out sorry, in one single blow. I move up carefully and as I approach, I slash at him but he screams out as he dies. And this could prove to be a problem because I think the guys inside the fort actually did hear that scream. Immediately I hear a gunshot sounding off nearby. Uh, the round is well clear of where I am. I don't hear the hiss of the bullet, but still, they know something's going on back here. I still do have some element of surprise because they don't know that I'm just one person and they probably might uh, be looking out over the valley to the north and the road to the west as well as this small back entrance. So at least their forces are going to be divided if I do encounter them. The edge of the fort looking down as the path approaches appears to be clear of hostiles. I can hear voices speaking just inside the fort so there are people nearby and I equip my assault rifle ready to face anyone who comes out of the fortifications. The assault rifle itself is a golden AK-47 that I found on the ground in the middle of nowhere. One of a couple of very rare golden AK-47s you can find throughout South Mali in this game. There's nothing particularly special about it other than that it's gold. It's no better than a regular weapon. So now I'm attempting to infiltrate the actual fort. Coming through this open door, I can see another sniper in the distance looking out towards the north. I could attempt to fire at him, but that would give away my position. I moved a little bit more into the fort and saw there's actually no one around here. Wherever the guards are, they must be up on the ramparts. So there's no one patrolling on these lower sections of the fort. And as I move in, I randomly come across the case I'm looking for in a nice stroke of luck. So it turns out it was very near this entrance. So now I can just exfiltrate. And since there are no guards around, they wouldn't even realize I was here. It'll be a long time before they discover that case is even gone. That is, of course, unless the guards have started coming to check the path away. So I need to still be careful as I move away from the fortress. But there's no one on the ramparts looking down. The path itself looks clear. The body of the man I killed has not been discovered. So now it should be possible for me to make a safe escape from the area and return to Mike's bar to give Paul the documents that he, for whatever reason, wants and hopefully earn his respect in the process. I had no idea where we even were, but the other guys seemed to know we were close. They started cursing the British to each other, like that was going to do anything. They went temporarily insane when a plane flew low overhead, sticking themselves into bushes and keeping quiet. But I can't really say they were stupid, because it was me leading the charge into that leafy embrace. But I wasn't dropping F-bombs and racist slurs like I knew something about war. By the time we stopped, I'd heard so many reasons to hate the British that I was twice as worked up as any of them. But at the same time, I was shitting myself because I was pretty sure we were all going to get shot within the minute. Well, turns out that was the end of my part in the mission anyway. The guys went on ahead with the weapons while I sat as lookout over the rest of the gear, sitting on a pile of their bags beneath a tree like a regular young guy waiting for a date with his summer girl. 
but I was waiting for a muddy old guy to come and tell me they'd just frag someone's face and ask if I'd like to carry my own body weight for seven miles. Turns out I didn't need Fergal to tell me anything. Pretty sure every person in Ireland heard the noise of that 50 calibre rifle. Not exactly subtle, but I guess it helped to make that point I was hearing so little about. Everyone came running back smiling like they'd heard Santa was coming to town. We packed up and left in about 10 seconds with me carrying half the shit but not caring as I was pretty sure we were being chased. Fergal kept me thinking that until about halfway. This time we were moving more spread out. I couldn't see anyone but Fergal from the cell as I walked and he was out of shouting distance. That was my chance to drop the crap and bug out. I had told enough lies to Fergal that he didn't know where I was from, but he would have found me. I was already in too deep after just half a day. I was IRA now. I had assisted a murder, seen enough guns to get me off for a year, and at the time I thought I'd earned the trust of a band of true heroes. There's being wrong, and then there's being totally wrong. So I've made it successfully back to Mike's bar the next morning. Let's go to Paul and see how happy he is to receive these supposedly secret documents. I was hoping to see you. Any sign of the documents? Badass. <laughs> badass. Well, he's right. Frankie is pretty badass. So, we've increased the amount that Paul respects us. That means if that crazy guy we saw with Ruben the reporter, who currently is our second best buddy, was to die, maybe Paul could be our second best buddy instead. And I think that would be a superior choice. So now a little later in the same day, I'm heading back into Parlour to visit the UFLL Faction HQ, hoping to gain some sort of mission from them. The objective of doing the missions, of course, is that these guys have links to the Jackal, and my personal mission is to find the Jackal. So hopefully, that if I just get involved in their operations, I'll find some sort of lead that will take me to my target. So I'm allowed inside the headquarters building giving up my weapons. Inside it's pretty much deserted, <laughs> covered in posters and detritus. So I just need to walk through and find the actual leader of the UFLL who is sitting around somewhere. I can hear them talking upstairs. Let's see what they have to say. Look at their gear, look at their God, Jesus, that is the highest quality. If the people think I brought in this special forces team, then they will say Kakumba is rich, taking their money and hiding it in secret bank accounts. Kakumba is buying entire armies as easy as food off a shelf. I wish you were rich, then we would have some old boy great stuff. Damn, look at that gun. I wonder if the Jackal can get us that. Another soldier for hire? What is a going great for missionaries these days? We fight for the FLM. You'd call me Dr. Kakumba. How you get across border? Nobody can come into country these days. Tell him. There is a special forces outfit in area just gun for hire guys, but they are armed to the teeth. They are paid to parachute in and grab someone. He doesn't need to know who. It's okay if he knows. They're here for a big shot from the APR, but if they take our enemy, we got nobody to fight. Just get to the point. The SF team is set up in good position in the desert, two kilometers to southeast. Kakumba here doesn't want anybody to think he planned secret rendition would make him look bad. Enough, please. All you have to do is to find this man and destroy their vehicles. The gear in their vehicles, radios, water, canteens, ammo, all the gear they dropped in. This is our struggle. Africa is for Africans. We do not need outside involvement. I expect you to stop this man. Job is yours. Standby point is in Southern Desert. Find the team and destroy their gear. Then they are nice and screwed. Payments here. Don't forget, this is secret mission. So you FLL guys don't know you. Don't expect any help out there. So that's it, they have tasked Frank with going on a one-man mission to destroy the equipment of these special forces so that they don't, in a strange way, take out the APR, which apparently is their mission, preventing the UFLL from having a cause to fight for and thus diminishing their power. A very strange fight with uh, no clear moral right side. So as I walk out, I get a phone call. Let's see who it is. Find me habit link is out of the OGC greenhouses. It's important. 
So that was Flora on the phone. I don't know what she actually wants because she didn't say anything, but I can go and meet her. This is an example of one of your buddies providing you with alternate mission objectives. So if I want, I can now go and visit her and find out what she wants me to do instead of what the UFLL have told me to do. So I might as well go and listen to her cause. And so, I kept pushing my oversized boots down into the picturesque landscape, dragging a whole campsite behind me. Eventually, I hauled my wreck of a body over a stile and found the whole cell grouped together. Fogel told me that everything went well and it was time to split up and head home. Had he furthered the Republican cause? Nope. But it sure felt like we had. Hearing Fogel praise us all made me feel something new, a pride in myself that I've been trying to recreate ever since. Too bad I'm not stupid enough to feel it anymore. Fergal walked with me some of the way back to Garrison, pumping up my confidence even more. Apparently that hike through the countryside made me a war hero. He was a manipulative bastard right from the very start, but I wouldn't see that for a long time. He told me he wanted me for future operations too, and I pretty much pissed myself with excitement and fear. I was to check back at their campsite every day from now on. One day he told me there would be a message for me to tell me what I needed to do. Shit. All I could think about was how damn cool I was. I was an operative. I was a warrior. I was suddenly everything the guys in the village joked and dreamed of. I went from the little kid to the town bully. From the son who didn't listen to his mum to the son who barely knew she existed. I was completely absorbed by the role that Fergal had spelled out for me. No one believed I was really IRA, that my stories were true. But all of them knew I had changed, and wasn't someone to be fucked with, even as a scrawny teenage egotist. I lived my life for no other reason than to see the signal for the next mission. I practiced, I wandered, I brawled and bullshitted my way through every social interaction. It was a couple of months of undying excitement and self-veneration before I'd get to see my new best friend again. I was in a dream so deep, it would take the screams of death to wake me up. So having fought my way through a couple of guard checkpoints, I find the uh, safe house where Flora is apparently hanging out. It's down by this small swampy oasis, so I'm coming to park up, trying to dodge the goat that keeps running in front of my vehicle. This is one of the better vehicles in the game I've managed to acquire, so I'd rather keep it for now than giving up, which is why I uh, rushed back at the last checkpoint to bring it with me rather than stealing one of the generic militia vehicles. So let's go inside and see what Flora has to say. Huh? You need to seriously ask yourself why you're playing these games with the factions. Sorry, none of my business. It's just, there's an informant at the villa. He's in contact with those special forces men you're after. If you can get to this guy, you can force him to send the wrong instructions. This will lead them to Mokuva, the shanty town. And that's where the APR is going to ambush them. The informant's Belgian. An unusual guy, hard to miss. Hate to lay traps, but I have no choice. They're here to get me. Look, I stole medical supplies, okay, and I sold them on the black market. What else was I supposed to do? The factions keep all the medicine for themselves. I tried to strike a deal with the APR. I'll have to go to the shanty town. If you can meet me there later and help me deal with these guys, I'd appreciate it. So that's the story. She says that these special forces are here to kill her because she has been smuggling medical supplies from their base to the people. A seemingly uh, altruistic act. However, in order to gain her respect, I now have to kill all of these men by leading them to a pre-planned ambush. So it seems there's some moral ambiguity and I'm going to have to make a choice. And you'll be finding out what choice I do make in the next episode of Frank's Penance.